Hello everybody, welcome back to the ASUS ROG YouTube channel. This is JJ once again, and we're going into another deep dive session, part two, advanced overclocking on Sandy Bridge E CPU X79 chipset and on the series, uh, on ASUS's series of X79 motherboards. So in our first video, if you guys check that out, we went into kind of essentially a deep dive regarding the actual UEFI, the settings that are present within there, kind of how they relate in terms of overclocking parameters and how they can help you to define the actual uh, values that you need to have when you're attempting to overclock the platform. Now the secondary part of the video is going to be focusing on aspects about how do we quantify stability, what type of considerations do we need to take into consideration when we're measuring stability, uh, thermals and a couple of other variables about overall quantifying and looking at you know uh, heat, dissipation, uh, stress testing, and a lot of kind of those elements regarding overclocking and specific to the X79 platform. So at the end of our previous video, we actually completed a, uh, an ADA run of a report that actually allowed us to go ahead and check the performance of that 4.8 uh, 1600 overclock that we had on our system. This is actually still the same exact system, same exact overclock that we have present, and now we're here actually at the desktop. And the focus is initially going to be is let's take a look at actually the type of thermals that are required. Now what we initially outlined that the actual Corsair H60 unit itself uh, was quite robust, it was generally going to start to be a little bit limited at a higher wattage levels in terms of heat dissipation. Now right now, nominally, we're actually looking at a system that's fairly conservative in terms of the actual um, quote-unquote idle wattage. If we actually go ahead and uh, take, for instance, uh, open up either ADA or HW Info 64, which we're going to do here, we're going to actually take a look and see actually at what we're looking at when we're looking at power draw for the system. So if we go ahead and open up ADA, and we take a look at terms of the package power draw. Uh, we can see that we're floating back and forth here in terms of actually the package draw. And right now we're approximately about 25 watts. Uh, so systems, of course, pretty lean in terms of being idle. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up HW Info here just for as a secondary reference. And we'll take a look here and see what we have running. And we can also see uh, right about here in terms of the, the max, we have about 53. Uh, and with our current power draw, approximately about 25 watts. So go ahead and, and just enable CPU monitor to give us an idea in terms of the relative frequency that we have right now. And uh, because we kept our C states active in the previous configuration uh, outlined in our overclocking introduction, uh, we're, we're going back and forth essentially between the idle state of 1.2 gigahertz and the peak maximum load state, uh, which was set to 4.8 gigahertz. So here, once again, we can see what we're looking at in terms of package power draw. Now, the most important thing you want to do after you kind of define your overclock is, of course, you want to stress test it. You want to take a look and ensure that the system is actually relying normally, um, is, is excuse me, running reliably. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, if you go into the forums and you ask a lot of people, a lot of people will actually tell you to run things like Prime 95 or run Limpack um, for X amount of time or do things like that. Now these are definitely valid uh, aspects in terms of trying to test your overclock, but there are important considerations to take into play. One is that they reach very, very high peak power uh, pull points. Uh, in terms of the actual wattage that's recreated for heat dissipation, they're also far outside the norms of what's generally required. Uh, when you're actually using your system day in and day out for the normal things that you're going to actually do on it. And so keep in mind that, you know, the relative cooling configuration you might have might not necessarily equate to being able to provide cool enough temperatures and even stability at prime levels or at limpack levels, but actually might be entirely okay at actually nominal levels uh, such as under normal gameplay. And at that point, you might not necessarily need to upgrade to necessarily a more advanced uh, CPU cooler. So these are important things to take into consideration. So overall, let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of things and see what we're looking at in terms of power draw. So we're going to go ahead and do a couple of things that are fairly, let's say, simple or straightforward that we do on a normal desktop. So and we're going to go ahead and monitor the power draw. So right now we're at about uh, 36 watts. And let's take, for instance, let's go ahead and maybe open up an MP3 file. So we've gone ahead and opened up the MP3 file. Uh, we're, we're, we have our playback going here and we bumped up a little bit. We're at about 41 watts, 42 watts. So we'll leave that playing there in the background. If we wanted to, we can go ahead and open up a, a, you know, a couple of tabs that we have here in terms of our web browser. We have even some multiple instances and here we have a whole bunch of pages. And this would kind of start to mimic kind of the system that you have in terms of um, what you're looking at for normal realistic usage, right? And 
If we still then go ahead and jump down and, and move away from that, we can see that we moved just from about 50 watts and we still haven't even exceeded a peak of about 56 watts. Um, so that's kind of an important aspect of consideration is that even kind of while doing a couple of these things all at the same time, we're not necessarily really pushing it. Even if we start to do more interesting things, like let's say all of a sudden we want to just jump over to playing a, a video on the system and we start scrolling through the system, you know, scrolling through the video, making adjustments, we're doing this, and all of a sudden, you know, we want to switch over to something else and say, oh, you know what, uh, let me go ahead and take a look at this picture that I wanted to look at here. So you open that up and uh, you then also say, well, I want to go back to that uh, web page that I was at, and so I want to make it look here, or maybe I want to check out this, uh, you know, awesome review on this X79 Pro board. Um, you know, we're, we're taking a look through here and we still essentially see that uh, we're not really pulling a lot. Um, and this is mimicking your actual normal real world usage. So we're going to go ahead and, and cut those items off there. And we can see that essentially that when we've gone ahead and tried basically things like watching a video, um, go ahead and playing music, uh, music files or, or doing web browsing, um, you're not necessarily getting a large impact. Even if we were to go ahead and start doing web-based video, web-based video is still going to get us generally underneath this. So if you went to you know, YouTube or you were playing back some DivX files, you're still only looking generally between about 40 to 50 watts. Now, if let's say we step up to something a little bit higher, um, you know, let's for one, let's actually open up uh, an extracted folder. We've got to do some processing there. So we can see our CPU jumps actually up to 4.8 gigahertz here. And we can actually see here, okay, we, we did actually use a bit of that processing power. Um, you know, and of course, we still have our web pages open. We could be reading, of course, if the file is larger, but we're still only peaking at about 65 watts. And the benefit is, that, of course, we can see here that actually we've got the system running very quiet. So it's effectively doing its job in terms of allowing the sufficient cooling performance. So as we can see here, that still our peak temperature hasn't really ever gotten that hot. Uh, in terms of uh, 52C, 52C, 48C, 47, 49, and 47, and our current nominal frequency being closer to the low 40s. So we're pretty solid in that regard. Now, if you're maybe more of a creative professional, you're starting to do more advanced things on your system, you could definitely start to pull more in the system. So we could do things like take, for instance, maybe uh, open up Cinebench. Uh, with Cinebench, of course, being a multi-threaded application and, and running more advanced renders, we can definitely start to pull more out of the system. So let's go ahead and jump into maybe uh, doing a, a full multi-core render. And we'll jump into a full multi-core render. Here we can see now we've definitely jumped up. We, we went up to about 152 watts and now we're consistently pretty much riding that. And uh, Cinebench is gonna go through very smoothly um, because uh, the actual cooling that we have is sufficient. We have voltage that's aligned with our tree 4.8 gigahertz overclock. And we can see that the CPU cooler has gone ahead and ramped up. Now we can see that directly as we bring up that actual package, power draw, of course, we're increasing the temperature as well. And it's important to consider that necessarily that voltage doesn't necessarily always correlate to um, being something that has to actively be dissipated because of course we could say we could run 1.5 volts um, but be running at only 3 gigahertz and never essentially have the CPU cooler have to ramp up. So it's really that combination of having to have a high frequency with generally a higher level of voltage uh, that's going to create that higher package power draw and have more wattage that needs to be effectively dissipated. Um, so we can see there that we definitely ramped up quite a bit. We got up to about 155 watts. So if we then take a look though at what a lot of users are going to do when you're doing a system, uh, excuse me, building your system for is going to be play games. So we're just going to run a general synthetic as kind of an example of what kind of draw we're looking at when we're doing games. So here we're going to go ahead and do Unigen. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, set it up pretty advanced. So we'll have DirectX 11, shaders high, tessellation normal, atroscopic filtering to 16, anti-aliasing to 4x. And we'll go ahead and run this guy. And uh, this will load up pretty quick due to our SSD as well as the actual cache that's on CNE Bridge E. Really helps improve this process. Gives you overall less micro studying, overall better gameplay. And uh, we'll take a look here at our draw. We can see that we've peaked out when the actual application had to start launching. And uh, we're now peaked out about 103 watts, but in terms of actual, look at where we're at. We're only at about uh, 75, excuse me, 65 to about 70 watts. Right now at actually 56. So actually not that much. Uh, the CPU is going to, of course, continue to work. And uh, this actually is a multi-threaded application. So we will see usage across uh, multiple cores, uh, but you're not necessarily going to be consistently ramping and hitting the, the CPU cores at a high level. 
Now we can see here we started to move up a little bit closer to about 70 to about 75 watts. And the actual cooler has gone ahead and ramped up, but it's still definitely able to keep our CPU at a cool level of operation, even considering both this game uh, engine being run as well as when Cinebunch was run. Uh, we only peaked out at about a 57C and with one core potentially reaching up to 59. So this cooler is still definitely doing its job. Uh, doing its job. Now, of course, if we have a larger radiator like on the H80 H100, we could actually more effectively dissipate this high level of wattage and be able to keep the system a little bit cooler. But keep in mind, once you put the chassis on there, um, you know, you're going to be able to minimize the sound a little bit as well. You could actually have maybe a little bit better operational airflow, but also the temperatures could increase a little bit more as well, uh, depending on your ambient and a couple of other considerations to take into play. But as you can see here, we're not really stressing the system. Now, if your system was to consistently pass all these parameters, then technically it's actually stable. Just because it fails under a much more aggressive stress test like possibly Prime 95 or Impact doesn't mean that it has a pass stability. Now, for you that, for the set of users that are really interested in though using that as a metric, keep in mind that you're really pushing a high demand on the system. So you really do want to ensure that you have a quality cooling implementation, got a quality power supply. Um, and there's also the reality that I don't advise these type of extensive synthetic high level tests to be run for a very long period of time. There's also an important consideration that with many of these kind of generic stress tests, they're not openly validated and tested by a large number of companies. Uh, whether it's by the actual local authors, which sometimes have limited access to the software, um, or, or even us. Now, we here at ASUS have taken time to definitely try to uh, check our platform out and ensure stability with these stress tests, but it is an important aspect to consider. Um, keeping this in mind, one example is we work very closely with Final Wire and they develop an actual application called ADA64. Um, this does actually have an integrated a stress test utility in it, which actually is very robust. And one of the key advantages is that it actually will execute um, multiple instruction sets that are on the CPU, such as AVX. This is important because other synthetic applications like Prime95 are much more FPU based and actually, even though they're putting an extremely high level of load on the system, um, they're actually not utilizing certain parts of the actual CPU architecture. And if you were to still potentially run something else, it might fail. There's also the consideration that you haven't really run anything that's interacting with the entire system. Uh, this is why I'm actually a good advocate of running your games, running playback, rip some, rip you know some uh, some DVDs or rip some CDs. Um, you know, start to do things that have to interact with the memory, the CPU, the graphics controller, the hard drive, and start to work your system out. Um, my general recommendation is ADA64 because it does place a very high uh, load on the CPU, has the actual CPU instruction sets is validated on, on Final Wire's development team, as well as ASUS works closely with be doing feedback with them. And secondary to that, to take things even further, I then run a secondary actually GPU test in the background. So what we're going to go ahead and do is uh, once again open up our wattage uh, to monitor here. We'll take ADA and we'll go ahead and go to the system stability test. Now the newest version is actually really cool. It's integrated a new CP, uh, stress test for the GPU so that you can run those simultaneously to exercise the system. And it even has an option to locally stress test the, the, the hard drive. So you can really uh, access a number of key areas for the system, the memory, the CPU, the FPU, the local disks, and the hard drives all simultaneously. So it gives you a very robust way of checking the stability of the system. For right now though, we're just gonna go ahead and go with these key items and we'll go ahead and see what our power draw peaks up at to. So we can see here that definitely that the fan is going to start ramping up to be able to counteract now the increased load that's on the system. And we can see now that we're essentially at 100% utilization across all our cores. It's gone ahead and ramped up. We're taking advantage of the instruction set and we can see now that we've gotten consistently up to about 154. Now, my general recommendation is at this point is keep close eye for about the next 10 to 15 minutes Generally, in this situation, if, you're, if your CPU was to pass this test, even actually the initial first minute, that's already a generally positive indicator. After about 15 minutes, a sufficient burning period has come that you'll probably start to get a normalized temperature to reference. And as we can see here, we're still getting an elevated temperature because things are still actually increasing. And right now, we're approximately about 73, 75. Ideally, we'd like to try to keep this CPU temperature consistently underneath, I'd say, 80, 80 C. And if you could, even potentially 75. 
And this is where the benefit of Corey going over to a little bit more robust cooler like the H80 or the H100 would definitely be able to assist you and be able to keep the sound profile reduced but while also aiding in the heat dissipation. But keep in mind as we show, this is also generally an unrealistic consistent workload. And unless you're somebody that's like a professional that's doing 3D rendering, um, high level audio and video editing, where to where in that case, as we saw with Cinebench with peak power draw, it might be more sensible to go definitely with an H80 or H100, especially if you're pursuing higher level clock frequencies. For Gramers though, an H60 solution would look to work pretty well for us. So as we can see here, we now gotten close to about 160 watts. Now generally, if it's gone ahead and stayed running reliably at this point, it's starting to give us an idea that the system does look to be stable. And usually at that point, what I would like to do to go ahead and get a little bit more interaction from the system, but then to go ahead and launch actually Unigen at the same time. So then that way I can go ahead and start stressing uh, the PSU and the rest of the subsystems, everything all simultaneously. So this is a great way to go ahead and exercise your platform and get an idea of that. But keep in mind, once again, you do need to have quality componentry in terms of being able to run this level of stress to the system so that you don't compromise the overall reliability based on a weaker component, such as, let's say, the power supply. So you can see here that now we've got Unigen loading up in the background. We've got ADA running simultaneously. It's a great overall indicator. And in most situations, pretty much if you can pass this, this is going to be uh, a, a great indicator that your system is working normally and then you're not going to have any long-term issues with it in terms of stability and reliability. Now one thing to keep in mind as well is, is that even independent of this, I generally also recommend try to run a general system stress test um, that actually mimics complete real-world usage, something like PC Mark 7, which while it might not potentially hit the peaks that uh, ADA does with their system stability tests, the great thing about it is that it will fully utilize all aspects of the system buffering memory, pushing things through the hard drive, through the GPU, through the CPU, through all the buses, and it gives you much more of an indicator about the real reliability of the system under real uh, configurations. So as you can see here, we're actually running both simultaneously. For most users, my general recommendation is going to be somewhere between about 30 minutes to an hour. Keep in mind that, of course, you are going to intermittently see slowdown in the actual 3D because we're fully stressing the CPU and its instruction sets as well also running the 3D game engine. Um, so as long as you see this consistently progressing over time, then you have a good indicator that the system is running reliably. Now we're going to go ahead and stop this at this point. Now that we've kind of got an idea, but we're also going to go ahead and jump to some of the more aggressive options. Now some of the more aggressive options that are available on, on the market in terms of power consumption and stress testing are going to be items like Prime 95. Now once again, we don't generally advocate this, but for you users that do want to use this as an option, you do need to be very conscientious of that the power wattage draw is going to be very high. In most situations, once you exceed um, 4.6 to 4.7, with corresponding voltages of generally about uh, 1.375 to 1.4 and greater, you're going to be looking at over 175 watts, and this is a lot of heat to effectively dissipate. Realistically, our H60 is probably not going to be able to keep with us at the upper end. We've got a pretty good CP here that we're running at a lower uh, vid that it's capable of, so we're actually going to go ahead and show this for you. Uh, but be, keep in mind that generally you would want better cooling, and the main reason is that you don't want to be close uh, to the junction point for the CPU, which you really want to stay away from, which is about that 88 to about 91 point. And like I said, ideally, if you can stay underneath ADC, then that would be fantastic. And of course, the cooler, the better overall.